Hi everyone, welcome back to another episode of Starting Out, a podcast where we share our stories of starting out in this great big world. We talk about our highlights, trials and tribulations, and lessons we've learned along the way. So as you are starting your journey, we hope you can learn from us. So Cor, what's the topic for today? So we actually finished a book, surprisingly, (laughs) together. We finished... The Measure of My Powers by Jackie Kai Ellis. And just as a little disclaimer, there will be spoilers. And I also want to give like a maybe like a trigger warning or a content warning. We're going to talk about some, some self-harm. We're going to talk about downfalls in relationship. Maybe a little bit of, you know, some heavier topics. But hopefully, you know us, we'll make it positive. So, where should we begin? Should we begin with, you know, the heavy hitting topics or should we start light first? We should start with the heavy stuff. It was sad. It was very, very upsetting to hear somebody talk about ending their life or wanting to end their life and having actual family members that have taken their lives. It's like a black out curtain that she's unveiling and you are seeing the insides of a very depressed person yeah and i think just the way that she started the book i wasn't really expecting that to be honest like right off the bat where she talked about ending her life and how the fact that she even like planned out like oh if i did this and this would happen and like it's, it was almost like a calculation that she made in her head where it's like oh the probability of this is like higher if i do it this way and you could tell that her thoughts and her mindset were so deep and like she's gone so far already right from the bat of the book which i thought to your point was very sad when i first read it because when I first got the book, I was like, oh, okay, I know a little bit about her already, right? Where are the pastries? And, <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> I'm like, I was expecting recipes. I was expecting, you know, like a la di like a walk in the park. But it was heavy hitting right from the bat, I'd say. Yeah. I think also one of the biggest things is on Instagram, we over glamorize people's lives. And if you ever go on her Instagram, it is beautiful right? You have the pastries, the perfect lighting, the perfect hair, all smiles, Mm -hmm. maybe some moody shots, you know, very artistic photos. You would have never have noticed that there would be any slight imperfection or sadness before she even like started Instagram. Like you thought like, oh, this person has picture perfect life. And guess what? Life is not picture perfect. Life is freaking messy it's freaking sad and one of the biggest things was that i think it was like the lack of options she had like what you said Mm -hmm. it was like very calculated very planned out and her cousin actually committed suicide in the end and then one of the silver linings of it not to take away from all that but one of the silver linings i thought was therapy access to resources having another option then going down this path, there is a way to take a right turn or a left turn out of the situation. You're not out of it yeah. like, all the way, but you do have another way of dealing up- upon it. Yeah, it's a really great point that you brought up her Instagram, where if you take a look at her feed, even right now, it's very, very bright. Like, you know, you would want to get to know her and you're like, oh, this this lady has the most picture perfect life. But the thing is, I think it almost overshadows like another woman's experiences right if like someone who has these thoughts as well and who's looking at her instagram page or someone else's instagram page would be like oh my god like i want my life to look exactly like this it's like the feeling like okay well if i suppress this part of myself and like if i just ignore this part of myself and not deal with it the right way like maybe i might just start something new that looks like what i want from this person's instagram feed which is 
it can get very toxic because it's almost like you're going down a rabbit hole where you're just constantly scrolling on Insta where you're like, oh, I want this person's living room. I, I want this person's furniture and like this person's body where everything is just very materialistic. It doesn't shed a light on our own problems anymore that we have to deal with, which is why I feel like still getting therapy now is stigmatized yeah. heavily, which is tough because if you need help, a lot of the times we don't know where to start, right? Mm -hmm. And it's also the cost of therapy as well, where a lot of these support programs aren't necessarily free and they're quite pricey. Mm -hmm. You know, the silver lining for her is that she ultimately had therapy and like she ultimately had these like different resources that she was able to kind of dig deeper into to help her with everything that happened in her past yeah one of the best things to come out of that situation was her showing us right how you can go so deep and so far down the rabbit hole and you can get yourself out of it with a little bit of time and patience and i think this is the part where like self-care and all that stuff sometimes people don't talk about it is like sometimes you just need help right you need professional help to get out of certain situations and i i thank her in that book for representing what that looks like and then how she basically gave us almost like an avenue of how to get out it's not everybody's way of getting out of such a dark place but it's almost like here's one like one resource or one way you can do it hard chapter to read to say the least yeah and i even think a lot of the times when we think of self-care it's almost like put on a face mask and you know relax <laughs> there was no face mask in the first episode <laughs> no our first chapter no yeah yeah, there were no face masks, definitely no face mask mm-hmm. in any of the chapters. Mm-hmm. So I think it's like when people think of self-care and self-help, it's like, oh, you know, I'm just going to read a couple of books and then I'm going to put on a face mask and, you know, I'm going to get into a little nice routine. But it's like if you want to resolve whatever issues that you're facing or whatever thoughts that you're having, it's really digging deeper into those motives And then, like you said, in the book, it's like she even provided different avenues that she herself had to kind of help her through the tough times. Mm -hmm. Good thing that you brought that up because maybe therapy is one of the best ways because Mm -hmm. what happens if you don't have a good support network and the people around you can't support you in the way that you need to be supported and then also carry forward out of a situation so the reason why we said that was her marriage with g and her family was so interesting i feel like it's like almost like soap opera drama level of like yeah where do people get this stuff right what kind of language were they spoken to Mm -hmm. when they were younger so that when she was coming up in her childhood and throughout her young adolescence into her well into her 30s it's like a oh girl i just wanted to give her a hug i just wanted to give her oh, a hug i know I, was like, I know yeah yeah there's the part in the book where she asked you he's like am i beautiful he's like oh i can't say that like it's not up to me to say that I think at that point, I just felt bad for her. Like you said, I wanted to go up to her and give her a hug and just tell her that she's beautiful. Because she didn't really talk about her relationship with G before, like all this downfall. So it was very like negative almost what I hear about G. So I almost wonder what qualities when they first started dating that she saw in him and that he saw in her, right? And like how that relationship dynamic played out. Mm-hmm. And I wonder how different it is compared to how she described it when, like, they were married. And it was so negative then. Yeah, I have this, like, pivotal moment where she, on her honeymoon, Mm -hmm. where she was like, ha ha, I wanted to go take a shower second. And they made it almost into, like, a 10, 8-year debacle. I was like... (laughs) girl why yeah. how did you not see the red flags yeah there's like a bit of family situation where i thought it was kind of crazy right where she was the day before her wedding and they let her yeah. said 
don't marry him. And I was like, what's she going to do? What's she going to do? Yeah. It's like, what good comes out of telling someone don't get married the night before their wedding? Like, what are you expecting out of that person, right? Like, are you expecting them to just cancel the wedding, cancel everything? Why specifically at that time? So crazy. Her family. Oh. I know. It was really interesting for her to be like, when a man does his work as a woman mm-hmm. and as a wife, you follow. Okay, we're very big on finances over here. <laughs> we're very like, yes. get your money and then do your thing. But I feel like yeah. in this situation, it was so interesting to be like, on the outside, think of all these people on the outside that like have their own business, have their own firm. Seems like a great marriage mm-hmm. or seems like a great relationship, but we don't even know half of the thing is on the inside and i thought was really crazy was like when he was like oh you got like two dollars to spend that's an exaggeration but it literally felt like that it was like Mm -hmm. two dollars to spend a week and then she's like this doesn't even buy me coffee (laughs) with a friend yeah right and yeah i just wonder you know like that dynamic of like control and like even her eating habits trigger warning again but like You know, her eating Mm -hmm. habits of such control and, like, her household having all these expectations of, like, you need to do this and that. But, like, if you come close to it, like, marriage should be a great thing. But it's like, oh, you can't marry this person, right? It's like, I feel feel the tug and I feel the push and the pull she must be feeling within herself. Yeah, I think... With all of her relationships, whether it's with family or with G, it felt like she had a lack of control and she had a lack of independence. So with G, I remember where she first started her business where like they were, I think they were splitting finances, but then G said, oh, like anything for the bakery, like it doesn't come out of us. Like you like deal with it yourself, like it's your own money. So as long as you have your own money, like do whatever you want with it. And so the fact that, like, it wasn't, like, a communal, like, responsibility, right? And it felt like he didn't support her financially and even emotionally as well. And even with the relationship with her and her parents as well, it's ever, I guess, ever since she was little, her parents always wanted to push her into, like, STEM. So whether it's, like, oh, you have to be good at math, like, you have to get high grades in elementary school, whatever, whatever, on all these, like, science and math courses where realistically speaking not every child is going to be awesome and amazing at every single subject right Mm -hmm. everyone has their own you know things that are they're good at and things that they're not good at but you could see that like they kept on trying to push her into things that she wasn't necessarily interested in but that her parents were interested in and you could see that she had a lack of control for that (laughs) Ain't that the tea? Oh my god. Let's um, Mm -hmm. ask you a question. Are there consequences to tough love? Because some people might think it's like, oh, this is how I got to where I am today. Like I was, like I had a big push, like I had to get well in all these grades and like I had to get married, have the kids, no sugar cutting. You must do these things usually out of good intentions right like you want your child to succeed but are there consequences to tough love (sighs) this is a heavy topic (laughs) here is is. be careful who you marry also girl if you want to do something and you earn that money oh my gosh and then also don't be so mean (laughs) i know yeah yeah that that's a good don't be so mean. yeah because you so, never know where yeah. that person is going to take it which is why i ask you is there exactly. a consequence to tough love <laughs> yeah i mean i i could see the benefits of tough love where it's like okay like you had the the intention was there where like you want the best for your child and you want your child to succeed but now it's so important about the way you talk about these things with their child how you phrase certain sentences and certain topics. let's repeat that one more time it's not what you say but how you say it is gonna yeah. bite you in the behind 
Yeah, that is so important because, you know, with my parents, like, I could see when I was younger, like, they just want what's best for me, right? As, like, a good parent. Maybe they could have done it this way and then I would have responded in, like, a different way, right? It's, like, showing my child that no matter what he wants to pursue, what he or she wants to pursue, like, I'm going to be there for them and I'm going to be there to support them. And it's always, like, if you're interested in something, go and pursue it further, Mm -hmm. and see you know what you make of it but yeah just don't be so mean with them be gentle and kind how about you do you think there are consequences there's always a cost to everything oh my god (laughs) ain't that the tea sis (laughs) ain't that the tea yeah i think well-intentioned meaning of oh i'm gonna do something that is very harsh i hope you take it in the right way and you bring very goodness to the family that way. But then it's like, how much mm-hmm. of that? And then how frequently? What are these expectations coming from, right? Like, if you want to do well in just in STEM, like, where did that expectation come from? And then mm-hmm. also, what happens if they aren't able to meet the expectation, right? Right? To tell your yeah. child they'll never amount to anything, right? Is the expectation mm-hmm. now because you weren't able to do a get into stem that's it you have to rely on me so i can rub it in your face for the rest of eternity (laughs) then it's like holy shit like is that your expectation of how you want to like raise your children she wanted kids and then he didn't want kids i'm like don't you want to talk about stuff like that beforehand just say just asking for a friend yeah maybe ask that before you tie a very significant yeah. legal knot. Like, make it clear. Like, you could say, like, oh, you know, like, we'll think about it later down the road. But, you know, at the beginning of the relationship, if they're already keen, like, no, I do not want children, and you think you have kind of, like, the capacity to change their mind and their idea about that, no, sis. No. No. There is going to be no budging, especially if, like, there was already things that she couldn't even convince him on, right? Like, even Mm -hmm. having friends over for dinner parties. Like, if you couldn't even do that, sis, like, later down the line, you probably won't have either the financial capabilities, right? If they have such a hold on your finances or the flexibility of, like, it would be different if someone was very open to things and they're, like, open to trying something, right? Yeah. But um, I love, at the very end, she was, like basically making a list of things that she would do for her children and she mm-hmm. was like i went and just gonna give them so many kisses and hugs I was like, yeah. why do why do we need to emotionally beat someone to yeah. the end for them to be like you know what maybe maybe yeah. not for the next person i even think with i remember you talked about the point of you know parents having these really high and really unrealistic expectations for their child i think part of that stems from them kind of projecting what they wanted to do themselves onto their kids right it's almost like okay here i have my prodigy my one and only my son and daughter and then it's like you stay away from that (laughs) i think it's almost like unresolved trauma and unresolved you know, thoughts that you had when you were a child or when you were a teenager, young adult, whatever. And that's why, if you can, everyone should get (laughs) therapy. If you can. Your 50th cheat mask is not going to melt away. No serum is going to take away your issues. So, yeah, that's why she sets a great example. Not that we're putting Mm -hmm. her into that, oh, expectations of her being an example. It's more like, I'm very happy that she went down the path of therapy and came to the realizations of like maybe things that have worked for other people will Mm -hmm. not work for me and maybe it's time to change it up a little bit it's not you being soft or anything it's more like you're taking a different approach and you're reading the situation now and you can see how damaging when it doesn't work because when it works it's great but when it doesn't work it literally blows up in your face so fast exactly yeah so we talked a lot about her family dynamics especially with g and her parents but you know shifting 
into more so of her career and the things, I guess, like her experiences that she's encountered. What are your thoughts about that? I think as us starting out, it gives me a lot. You're more at ease because I feel like Mm -hmm. these stories don't get passed in media or celebrated enough. People really Mm -hmm. like to gloss over the rough times and then just be like oh and she had a successful day bakery and she went to paris for pastry school right Mm -hmm. it's more like her journey to finding success and finding her passion alleviated my expectations of myself again expectations they haunt you yeah of like by 25 i need to do this do that by 30 if i'm not owning a firm if no 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 like making like whatever yeah if i'm not doing the benchmarks of life then there's something wrong right and she was a great yeah. example that she took her time for better or worse probably some of the stuff was just like whoa okay that's a little too too crazy crazy but Mm -hmm. she did take her time and it's not a typical timeline but it gives you a perspective of like it doesn't have to be a typical timeline of graduate make partner retire when you're 45 you know what i mean no yeah yeah that's such a good point you know everyone has a different timeline right but it's less talked about because when i guess when we're all starting out um everyone is going to school right like you have the same classmates and besides from aside from school like you can't really do anything outside of the time right Mm -hmm. but we really start to see people flourish i would say even from high school going to university as well as university going into their full adult life i would say seeing people for example in high school taking a gap year whether they're working whether they're traveling and or even if they're just figuring it out and starting out in this great big world Mm -hmm. and I think that's the most important thing is that try your best not to compare your experiences with someone else's experiences whether that be with life whether that be in your career whether it's your personal life it's really hard to do but once you start to compare yourself for example in your career right like oh this person worked at this company for like and then they did so well and they had such a nice position like i want to do that well you know first of all you don't know what their experiences are like right you don't know like what it took for them to get there and it's like even though you may not be at the position use that as your goal right like use that as your driving force to polish up your resume, to like look for new skills, to like get new certificates and network, right? So almost mm-hmm. like use that as a fuel to push you into that direction as opposed to you just like self-loathe and be like, I'll never get there. Yeah, I feel like she also had that type of mentality when she first started art school, when she had to get her perfect grades in high school and her parents, again, didn't think she would make it. But she does it and now she gets to go to art school but then in art school she couldn't really lean in to her passion just cooking and stuff and she had to go to design school because she thought it was like the safer route so i guess my little question to you is you have so many questions i have so many questions today (laughs) speaking of passions Mm -hmm. you can see that she ended up going to school for art but she chose a safer route where she built a firm and everything again very successful and all that but what do you think about like when you have to pick between your passions and your what pays the bill like do you think you can balance the both because in her case it really worked out yeah but i just wanted to ask you that i have a strong belief that Our identity shouldn't be tied to our work or our career. So There you have it, folks. (laughs) Breaking news. (laughs) Everyone needs to make money, right? Everyone needs work to make money. But the thing is, if all you're thinking about is your 9 to 5, how do I advance in my career? What am I going to do today for work? But you have nothing else besides from that, that you could tie your identity to, I think that's the problem. Because Mm -hmm. then you don't really have a passion. If you do have a passion on the side, but you're spending so much time at work, it's like you don't have the amount of time or the mental capacity to actually have fun doing your passion project. 
Mm-hmm. So I think it, it's like a tough line trying to balance time wise and effort wise your work as well as your passion. Mm-hmm. But I think I definitely think we shouldn't tie our identity just to our work. Yeah, I I could definitely see like she went down that path of being so tied to owning your business Mm -hmm. and all that stuff. I think she posed a really good example of how you can find little pockets of time to nurture these passions, right? Yeah. Again, like we said, you can't do your work all day, every day. You're one of that. So if you're in a situation, maybe you got to this point in the book and you have this like issue of like, okay, I want to be successful. I want to do all these things. But what else is there in life? She asked like it's such a big question when she, her and G were having this firm and she was like, for what reason are we basically stockpiling or even earning this much money? She ended up taking a gap year, six months to a year, and she had this gap year to be able to take a break from her work to go to Paris. Yeah. And it's like, it was very inspiring to see somebody take control of the situation because you can always spiral yeah. into like more money, more stockpiling, blah, blah, blah. But then it's like, what are you trying to do with that stuff? Yeah. In her case, it just turned out to be a very awesome thing that she actually ended up doing because you wouldn't have any of this without it. Throughout the book, I kind of saw a shift in her mindset of before where she didn't have much control of her life, where she didn't feel as independent from her relationships, but transitioning to when she went to Paris with G. And it's almost like we saw snippets of her trying her best to become more independent. So I remember in the book, it was early morning and she was still sleeping and she's like Mm -hmm. i want to explore paris like this is what i want to do and so she took the time to wake up early and i remember she was walking around the streets just taking in all the sights and all the view she tried out different pastry restaurants and like little cafes from these little snippets we got to see that even though it seemed that she was very miserable and it seemed that things weren't going her way But she still tried to take control of that and she still tried her best to be independent and really Mm -hmm. kind of follow her passion of pastry. Whether she's like, oh, I'm going to go to a cafe. And she found her favorite croissant place to like sit down and like eat a little snack and like drink some coffee. It was very evident where it's like that shift. And I'm so proud of her. Yeah, honestly, like she is such a great example of if things are going so bad, you can still find a little bit of time for yourself Mm -hmm. to turn the situation around. Because once you find joy in what you like to do, it snowballs, I believe, right? So then she like, you can yeah. really see her doing that of like, she really leaned into it and she really went to school for it. She went to the markets, got even more excited, was starting to go out for dinner, mm-hmm. understanding all the cuisine. And then she ended up having a bakery of her own to give back the feeling that she had to people mm-hmm. in Vancouver. You think it's like, oh my God, this is so great. Like she is, you know, she got divorced. She's starting her own bakery. She's doing her thing. Like she's living her life. You know, mm-hmm. if you have a passion and you start leaning into it and you start exploring it further, yeah. at what point would you say it's safe to make a dive and a jump into whatever your passion is and quit or like push away your full time gig to actually pursue whatever your passion project is? Mm-hmm. And follow up question to that is what kind of skills or qualities do people not necessarily notice or not necessarily think about when they're making the shift? I'm not saying it's as easy as when your net income turns 25.777, this is the ideal spot of moving on and quitting your job. Your assets are more than your liabilities. Like, I could never give that advice out but i think it's more so like you have a feeling within inside you right and you know that feeling you know it very well sometimes you can do the math on things you understand what is coming in into your life right Mm -hmm. and then what you're able to give there's no right time to actually move but i feel like when you are leaning into your passion and you understand at some point that like what you're doing in your regular job no longer get as much out of it either financially or within the work itself 
you will know to actually go and pursue your passion. I also think that like you should also give yourself credit like especially when she basically was like i've never opened a bakery in my life before this is where i'm like boosting her i'm like girl you own a business you own a full yeah. business with g like you know what's going on but she you forget that you learn things in the past and it can use as tools to actually guide you forward so even though she never had a bakery she had a business before and then also she had the business acumen to be like i'm gonna cover my bases right i'm gonna call it a bakery i'm going to read every book under the sun and then basically i'm gonna do it and then i'm gonna figure it out i feel like that in itself is so valuable but where i want to get into is is there such thing as toxic productivity because okay at the end of the day she like basically was so determined on making it successful and she was so resilient and like even her apartment renting story right she takes her apartment she you know rents that out goes for half the price into a dingy basement i just think life is basically one big work in progress right so you think like okay this is where the storyline and maybe this is where movies come in it's like this is where the you know so this lady the protagonist basically turns her life around starts a bakery falls in love with another man and has three kids and blah blah boom (laughs) like life is perfect life has no issues but i feel like it's almost like her insecurities of like failure is starting to come out and i just felt it was a little (laughs) toxic to be that productive and you can see it in the end it was almost like she was at the line and I felt at certain points where she described her experiences after opening, like the first year of opening the bakery and it like crossed the line a little bit. I remember she was like, oh, like sometimes I'd soil my pants yeah. um, and like I never realized it until someone else pointed out like, oh, what's that smell? Or like, you know, there's a lot of like incontinence happening. It would, I, I could see that could get very toxic and it could get very demoralizing. <laughs> Anybody got their shot glasses out? Yeah. Yeah. So I definitely think there is such a thing as toxic productivity. It's so hard not to fall into, especially if you have your own business, right? If you like pour, I could definitely see like she poured her heart and soul into this experience. Mm -hmm. And if it does fail, the onus is on her and no one else. That amount of pressure on you to succeed in a business in one year, it, it's tough. It's tough. Yeah. I feel like she's a great example of like, even if you pursue your passions, it's not all rosy and it's not all fun and games. You still have to put in the work for it. But there are limits to things, right? You as a person mm-hmm. have your limits. There's always ways around where you can get really mm-hmm. creative on how to come out of such a toxic productivity yeah it's just one of those things where it's like in the end failure is not a bad thing alleviating yourself from that pressure and the, again where did this expectation come yeah from? <laughs> it's like did you set the expectations like did someone else set it for you and is it realistic to achieve those expectations and like if you don't meet those expectations like what happens does the world blow up i agree this was a great window into someone's life of like okay i find that a lot of like maybe business podcasts or whatever they always like to do the highlight reel but this was a great example of like if you have a passion since you were a kid and you weren't able to go forth with it how many windy roads you will go down and how many setbacks and forward motions and all that stuff you're going to experience I I feel like at the end of the day it was a really good story in terms of career and purpose wise to really look into and I even felt that throughout the book you could see that her passion showed like it was very evident that she was very passionate with pastries and with baking and so each chapter she almost tied a recipe 
to the theme of that yes. chapter, which is crazy. The recipes are amazing and I want to try them out as well. But the fact that there was a story behind that recipe, it was so amazing. You can tell she's so creative in that sense, right? Where one of the greatest things that came out of this book is yeah. her ability to tie these recipes to her life and make it almost like a milestone. So what you yeah. would think is a milestone is like chronological right by 25 i need to do this it almost was like yeah by the time i mastered this recipe this was a milestone in my life yeah. or this is the thing i had to do in my life and i thought it was really interesting we made up time it's all an illusion anyways so we might as well tie it to something you like yeah any parting words do you miss paris after reading oh. this book yes okay i quarantine things can't go anywhere i feel like books are the one of the greatest escape mechanisms and i didn't even expect to be teleported to paris yeah. that was another thing when i saw her instagram i was like why do you like paris that much like not mm. that it's bad or anything but i'm like it's a very random thing to be like i'm gonna buy a house there i'm gonna be like i'm gonna put my roots down then it all made sense i actually followed her on instagram first and then mm. you just kind of brought it up the book like oh you should read it but i didn't realize that there was such a connection and it makes me want to go back for not that i ever went there for not for food but i always went there for art but now i'm like yeah i just go eat i just want to it's so funny fun. that you mentioned that you follow her on instagram and then you read her book but for me i read her book first and then halfway through i saw like i scrolled through her instagram and it's just you know i could see that if you knew her before it's almost like oh like everything is great la di da but then it's when i was scrolling through her old pictures halfway through the book i was like oh my goodness like i i see some of the things that were happening yeah clearly we recommend the book because we like it so much i read it in two days which is unheard of because oh, i am I literally the slowest reader on planet earth parting words is go to therapy always ask yourself where does this expectation come from was it made up did you make it did society make it did your parents make it did timmy from like one random right night yeah. out the playground told you something and now you stick it to your heart yeah right not to say that we're perfect or anything but we're not we got our own shit to deal with yeah everyone has different timelines so you know it's very easy to judge our experiences against someone else's on social media they just want you to see the positives keep that in mind yeah we would love to know what you thought of the book and what kind of messages or crazy stories that you enjoyed or were very heartbroken or whatever emotion invoked mm -hmm. in you because there was a lot of little nuggets in there. So yeah, yeah. we'd love to hear from you. Yeah. And if you want to reread the book and get another glimpse of what else you may have missed in the books, feel free to do that as well. There's, I feel like once you read the book, like the first time, you try to get a glimpse of like the bigger picture. But I think if you read it a second and third time, you start digging deeper where you're like, oh, I forgot that in the first time. Like I didn't see that. Mm-hmm. With that being said, happy reading, and we will see you on the next podcast.